Oh, it's so great to see you all. Thank you all so much for coming along to the session tonight. Um, so we, so I am really excited to be here and I, I guess, like we were just talking about before, want to acknowledge the amazing program. It's really, it's, it's a real privilege to be part of this incredible program. So thank you so much for inviting me. When we were talking about this pro, uh, what, what I would do tonight, we were really talking about um, focusing on one particular interest that I have at the moment, which is really as health professionals, how can we start to look at the work that we do through a, a lens, using death literacy as a lens uh, and, and looking at the way that we work and assess people with that lens. So before I get started, I do want to acknowledge um, acknowledge country um, and acknowledge the Wiradjuri people who are the traditional custodians of this land where I am in Dubbo in western New South Wales and I would also like to pay my respects to pa elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Aboriginal people who may be here tonight. So I want to also acknowledge that um, I'm I, I was talking about slashies before, but I'm an unusual health professional in some ways because I started life as a, as a clinical psychologist, then kind of moved into research and then started doing community development work and founded the Groundswell Project and Film Life Project and some compassionate communities work so really for 10 years I was working as a community development worker and a researcher and a health professional all at the same time and I feel like uh, as part of the death literacy work that we do that it is really important to acknowledge our experience and I'm going to keep encouraging you that uh, you to do that as part of as part of the the talk tonight because our experience is an important part of our death literacy and I certainly bring all of these things with me when I'm with a client. Now I might not share all of them but I'm bringing that that kind of experience and ideas and things that I've um, I've learned from artists and nurses and community development workers and researchers and people who have influenced me in my life. So I've been very fortunate to work with an amazing group of people and I must acknowledge and want to acknowledge really the, the Caring at End of Life research team and beyond that who have been working on this work and other work that's been really very foundational work in this space around death literacy for about a decade now. So um, I want to acknowledge all of them and, and really I'm standing on their so shoulders when I talk anytime but um, particularly tonight. There is of course um, a number of reports and for those of you who might be kind of starting to build this work in your practice I would encourage you to have a look at some of the the work that uh, we've published and if you have trouble finding any of it please feel free to to email me or to email Lane or whoever you need to to get in touch but the um, the evidence-based work that we're doing um, the, the work that we did with carers 10 over 10 years ago now was really the kind of foundation work that helped us to understand this thing we now call death literacy and it was describing trying for a term to describe the transformative effect that participating in caring that's where the term death literacy came from. So we were trying to find how do we how do we figure how do we describe this thing? How do we how do we talk about it in a really succinct way? And that's how death literacy came to life. But it was the so it was the participation in end of life care that was the catalyst in the research that we initially did, the catalyst for learning about death, dying, loss, and grief. And for us. Uh, and so one of the findings also was that it wasn't just about learning about caring or about dying, but it was the ex an extension of that. When people were caring at home, they were also learning about how to do death care. 
They were also learning about, well, how do we manage the funeral now? What do we do next? How do we, how do we um, bury someone from home? Things like that. So, so that was really um, an important kind of part of the finding and, and an important reason we called it death literacy because it's about the death system. And we didn't call it end of life literacy and, bereave, and grief literacy, which are also really um, unique terms and worth kind of looking at as well. So today I'm going to do an overview of the death literacy concept, but I'm going to really kind of drill it down into our clinical practice. And I'm going to use an example of advanced care planning, using an example of um, a case that's kind of a bit of a combination of a couple of families that I've seen, but one in particular, and you'll see that kind of come to life, hopefully. But I want you to reflect on that. So if you haven't already got a piece of paper and a pen, what I want to encourage you to do is to to grab a piece of paper and a pen and to, to in a moment, um, start to think about some of the reflections that you have when you read the case. We're going to talk about the strengths um, and the networks that are involved in advanced care planning, which is taking, I guess, what we want to do with death literacy is take advanced care planning from an individual kind of medical perspective and broaden it out as far as we can and stretch it as far as we can to understand how someone's planning and preparing for dying is actually a, a, a social event and um, involves death, uh, you know, death literacy and all of the, the silos across healthcare. So one of the one of the other reasons I want to do this is because one of the findings from my PhD, so this table is from my PhD, so sorry to get all nerdy, but um, one of the reasons I'm showing you this is because when I, so I looked at a group of people who were health professionals and a people, a group of people who were community workers, community death workers, I called them. So we had these two groups and one of the things that um, emerged from that was some of the different ways that we do death and understand knowledge um, as health professionals. So we've got mostly as health professionals when we're working in a health space we often have great health system knowledge. We know policies, we know procedures, we know what our institution says about a, B, C, and D, and what we need to do when A, B, C, or D happens. We understand how advanced care planning happens within that health system. Because our knowledge is professionally based knowledge, so um, nursing knowledge comes from a different perspective, psychology knowledge, social work, and so on. All of those, those professional backgrounds kind of come into to play as well. And they're influenced by formal learning, whereas for a lot of community death workers, practical knowledge and death literacy was actually the formation of, of their learning. The reason we have that knowledge, the purpose of that knowledge, the, the finding from my PhD was one of the purposes for, for those institutional death workers is because the focus is on improving end of life care for patients and families and improving knowledge about end of life care amongst our other colleagues. So educating our colleagues about palliative care, about end of life care, and ultimately because the goal is to ameliorate symptoms, to be able to improve the experience for people who are dying. So our role in, this, in the health system is to be a health professional, we're often an advocate and we're certainly many of the people I spoke to and I'd be I'd love to hear what your thoughts are about this but certainly the word activist as a health professional is a really kind of strong word and often um, not seen as a word that people would use to describe themselves or describe their experience in the system and if anything it might be alienating to other health professionals in the system. I'd love to hear if anyone, if anyone's thoughts about that. Does that make sense or any reflections on that? 
Are there things that you relate to on there? Are there uh, for those people who are kind of straddling both, and I can see that there are many of you who are doing both community-based death work, so maybe as a death doula, I'm putting that hat on, so non-medical work, community-based work, and institutional-based work where you're putting your hat on for the hospital or for the service that you're providing. So for those people who are straddling, do they get a sense that they're moving back and forth between two kind of knowledges um, or two kind of ways of being in the world? Anyone? Kerry, I have to say from my point of view, I'm a community death worker. I'm not medically trained. Yep. Um, but we see this time and time again that the, if you like, the institutional death workers don't have the time to get out into the community. Mm -hmm. Whereas we're here 24 seven, we, and, and there's a big difference, but because we work together most of the time, yeah. that's what makes a difference. We actually come together. They tell us their side. We tell them what's happening on a day to day, 24 seven basis. And it actually works quite well. Yes. I, that sounds like the best of both worlds, doesn't it? Being able to bring both elements to that, because I think um, for families too, the experience of being able to have access to someone when they need someone can really make, and the same person can really make a, a big difference for the experience around end of life. Thank you. Any, any other sharings or thoughts before we go to the next bit? So just a reminder about what is death literacy? So death literacy, so we, divide, we define death literacy as knowledge about understanding of the death system. So when we think about death literacy, we're thinking about the impact of death literacy provides individuals and communities with capacity to care for one another around dying, death, loss and grief. So we're in that public health framework when we're thinking about death literacy. And so we've got four elements and the death literacy index in particular has helped, I guess, um, helped, helped us in some ways to understand more about these different elements. So we've got knowledge, skills, taking action and experience. And so knowledge, um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to, hone in on each of these four things using the case study. So would it be helpful for me to quickly go through them again or does it feel like we can move on? Probably Linda, move on. I think. Move on? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Right. All right. So the reason um, that we I guess we want to kind of focus also on kind of bringing, we want to acknowledge um, the stuff particularly around um, experience because we know that Australians, for example, and we're really, we only have data on Australia really at the moment um, in terms of normative data across the population, but we know that um, experience may, uh, plays a big role in in a people's death literacy. So higher death literacy scores seem to be related to, to, the, to a person's personal experience. And in Australia, we don't, we score weakest on our factual knowledge. So legal and administrative processes in particular um, seem to be lowest. So we know that personal experience, then fa family kinship, and then faith-based activities, which are actually kind of way down the line, are really important. But I guess what I wanna, what I wanna emphasize is that both traditional learning, so being able to pick up a book or go to a class or do death education, is is also important. Uh, it is as you know is important as as important as experiential learning learning from experience. Just seems at the moment, which is really interesting, that you know we think one hundred and sixty thousand people die in Australia each year. That's a lot potentially, right? A lot of death literacy out in the community if experience is part of um, is, is part of death literacy in the way that we know it. So where is 
all the, where is all this untapped knowledge in our communities? And I guess that's where the role, that's the role of compassionate communities, right? If we start to kind of connect with people around um, uh, uh, in normal settings, in social settings, then hopefully compassionate communities can start to unearth a bit of the death literacy in our community. So let's talk about Joe. And while you're thinking about Joe, while while we're kind of just getting to know Joe, I'd really like you to write down some reflections and to have a think about him. And I bet that you've all met Joe or a version of Joe along the way. And I picked him for a few reasons. He's kind of not the usual um, kind of palliative care, maybe pa patient person that, that we might see. He's 38. He's married with three children who are 12, 10 and seven. And he plays in a band and really, you know, I, I still remember Joe and he was so, you know, his band was everything. He'd done that since he was younger. And he was starting to actually stop playing in the band as much, which was a really big thing for him. He works in a music store. So that's really important to him. Obviously, his wife is a teacher and they've been married for 14 years. So he now, it, it wasn't until he was 17 that they found um, cardiomyopathy and his dad died of, um, his dad died suddenly and his uncle died suddenly. So this, these are very kind of, we think about experience, for example, these were very salient, very real experiences for him in his life with, um, with heart issues. So he's been going to a cardiologist, you know, half his life. He's been hearing about heart issues and, and heart problems for more than half of his life, for most of his life. And now here he is. Um, he was um, overweight, but um, he was being told by everyone to lose weight so that he could possibly have a heart transplant. So he was getting kind of mixed messages about whether or not he was going to be suitable to have a heart transplant anyway. But really, um, the key thing for him was that he really didn't want, you know, he really didn't want to die. But he and his wife were, um, you know, I think I wrote it down here. We want him to have quality of life. We know we aren't going to grow old together. So he came when I met him he was like a ball of frustration and anxiety he was expecting that I was going to counsel him into thinking that um, he should just lose weight and everything would be fine or he should just be more positive or that I was going to kind of focus on on you know trying to get him to change his mind because everyone had said to him up until that point you're a young man Joe you need, you, you're going to, you know, you've got another 10 years in you. That's what they would say to him. And um, that, that may well be true. And Joe knew that that was, that may well be true. But for him, he also wanted to kind of, he was grappling around actually with a plan. He was trying to talk about what might happen if he has, a sudden cardiac event and it ends up in hospital but no one would go there with him like no one and so when I asked him about advanced care planning kind of naively thinking that that he might um someone might have talked to him about that he had no idea what I was talking about like we were talking like completely from zero no one had talked to him about it that and it was like it was simultaneously a shock and a relief. I could see it in their faces and his wife started crying and it was, um, it was just like, and all I'd said is, is, you know, do you, have you thought about having an advanced care plan? So reflections. So thinking about death literacy, what are some of the things that come to mind about Joe from a death literacy perspective? 
Just quick reflections, just to begin with. There's no right or wrong. Okay, Joe's already had an experience with his um, with his father and his uncle dying fairly young, uh, fairly young. Yep. Um, he doesn't. He he wants to do something, but he doesn't quite know what it is he wants to do. So he doesn't have a, He doesn't have any plan, and he is still quite young. And it would be wonderful if Joe were able to own his health and come up and make a decision about well. He, he's obviously aware that he's not going to live to an old age. So it would be wonderful for Joe um, if, he, he could, if he could come up with a bucket list. If he's got a short life expectancy, how does he want to spend it? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So and, yeah. kind of expand on kind of how, how, does, well, how do you want to live your life, Joe? Mm. What's mm. important to you? Yep. Mm. What else? Great. Thank you. That's great. What else? What else stands out to the other people in the room? Um, um, they, one of the things that stands out to me is the fact that no one had talked to him. Yeah. And I assume that's to do with their difficulty and their denial of, mm. you know, at their um, identification maybe with him as a younger person and their own sort of yep. about, mm. about death. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's not uncommon in the, um, it's not, it's not always true for every team, but certainly the cardiologists were pushing, you know, you've got 10 years in you, you know, come on. Um, but that, that just wasn't, that just didn't connect with him as his, as a person and his own mm. values. Um, Kiki's written, he needs a death plan. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. He, I mean, he does in a way, right? Um, I think one he needs things, a life plan. A, and a life plan. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's where I think a death plan, a death plan and a life plan really are the same thing for mm. someone who's facing a serious illness, aren't they? They're really, it's really about how is this person going to live with this condition that they have? But if they do die or if he does have a cardiac event, then how's everyone going to respond to that? How are they going to manage it? Lane. I think he needs to talk to his children as well as a group. Absolutely. So, so that and and would you say like, do you, what what difference would that make? Do you reckon, Lane? Like, what would I that think do about? Make the whole family more comfortable with the whole situation, um, whatever the outcome. Yeah. But does anyone else want to add to that? Because I think that's a really great point. When there are kids involved, what do we all do? We kind of suck a breath in and we don't breathe out. Because yeah, I think it, Go on. Oh, so I was just going to say, Carrie. I think it's it's also almost sad that you know when when the doctors keep saying, "But you've got thirty years in you. You've got 30, There's there's almost not creating the space for him to consider death. Yeah. Yeah. There's this implicit expectation in that where he doesn't get the choice to consider his mortality really yeah so it's I like agree. a disempowerment i yeah. completely agree with that and it, it's almost a has he been allowed to have an acceptance of death yeah you're all gonna die so you know hey if it's my time can i just go ahead and do it but because yeah. we've got expectations on us oh well you know you've got another 30 years and you've got children and you must do that not everybody mm -hmm. feels that way they don't. And I think, you know, this was a, a young man who was actually more fearful of what would happen for his wife yeah. and, and the kids. And so if he did, for example, be, um, go and play in his band, what would happen if he did have a cardiac event in the band? So guess what, guess what he came up with? Guess what he came up with in, in response to that? Put the band through CPR training? <laughs> so he needed to talk to his band as well because, like, yeah. they're, his, they're his mates, right? And the place where he's going to have a cardiac event maybe is with the band in practice or wherever. 
And then, and then, because we were in New South Wales, we also had this. We have ambulance plans in New South Wales, so there was also an ability even to kind of talk. <laughs> that's right. If it can happen to Greg the Wiggle, actually, that's a good example. Um, it was a, mm. it was a bit before Greg, but um, but so that so he needed to also talk about the band because of course when someone has a cardiac event the first thing we do is call an ambulance and the first thing we do well the first thing we do is cpr then we call an ambulance and it, and it's it's an emergency in his case it's an emergency but it's not an unexpected one mm. so how do you manage that in in your family how do you manage that in in your um, in your life, in your experience with people. Any other thoughts or comments? There's another comment here. I would be teasing out from Joe his understanding of his father and uncle's illness and the experience around that. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, Michelle, did you want to say some more about that? What do you think would come, what, or, or anyone else, what do you think would come from that? teasing out of of his experience both did it expose any anxieties he had around that yep it would it would but and and if we take a death literacy lens to that so so you know um i agree and so there there's probably anxieties there no doubt i wonder what he learnt mm. that yeah. actually might help him yeah, well. I, think, I think sometimes I say to people, it's easier to um, look at your experiences that you've had with death and funeral and, and weed out the things that are unacceptable. That, that's a, a good starting point for your own planning. Yep. 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 What's unacceptable? So anyone diagnosed with a heart um, I guess also the things that are, are acceptable. Yep. Uh, and, and just to revert to an earlier point, the um with with joe's case um because of his cardiomyopathy um the kind of arrest and the kind of prognosis and so some health literacy as well about you know is resuscitation appropriate uh what kind of outcomes could he expect yeah. so, so actually taking into account the kind of details of his pathophysiology, if you like, um, should be part of his life and death, life stroke death plan. Yeah, that, and yeah. that's such that's such a great point, Beth, because I think mm. for him in particular, because no one would go there with him, mm. uh, he really he couldn't do that. So that's where a GP or you know mm. a GP or I don't think the cardiologist. Could you know? Could go there maybe with the facts they could go there, but it wouldn't kind of mm -hmm. give him that experience of of really being able to explore it in in the way that um, he needed to, or it hadn't up until that point. So, I think um, I think that's such a great point. All right. Well, let's any any more thoughts about Joe at this stage? And I'm going to move through each of the the aspects of death literacy and just talk about some of the key things. And it's probably going to be a bit of a summary of some of the stuff we've talked about so far. Catherine, did you have something? Did you were you? No, I was just going to um, I was just going to agree with um, Beth's comment really that often often not understanding what's going on particularly when you've got um, serious health problems, can be quite paralysing to someone. Yeah. And the family. You don't know, you don't understand. Um, you've got no direction for plan forward or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. Let's dig in. So let's talk about skills. So this is, this is where we think about... Um, so there are two parts of death literacy skills. One is thinking about kind of hands-on support. What are the things you need to do to support someone um, around end of life? But what are the things you need to do in terms of talking support? So we've talked a lot about talking. Um, but when we're working with families, and we're kind of using a death literacy lens, it's kind of like what are the family and client or what are they already doing? 
and how would they rate their kind of confidence? So one of the things that often people don't get an opportunity to talk about is how confident they feel about the things that they're already doing. And it means that they might not actually tell you about, oh, you know, how they're getting dad to the toilet or how they're moving someone or how they're doing a medication because they don't want us as health professionals to worry about them or to to perhaps think that they aren't up for the caring experience. So focusing really as much as we can on people's strengths and, and also how and facilitating, if we can, the conversation about values and wishes. So this talking bit is where, you know, I think in... Um, in Joe's case, what I would have liked to have done is also had a conversation with the cardiologist. I'm not sure how much that would have helped, but I would have really liked to have understood a little bit about what was happening for him and why it was difficult for him to maybe go there with Joe because Joe really trusted this guy, really trusted him. And really, um, he was quite an important relationship to him. So this other column over here is about us as health professionals and our own direct experience and how, so when it comes to skills, how can we support our clients to learn the skills that they might feel less confident about? And how can we facilitate that by perhaps being a mediator and a support or a conduit to other people uh, to other health professionals so if we're working in a team of course that's easy because I can I can say hey um, would it be okay if I brought the physio back and we talk a little bit about how you're moving your dad it sounds like you're a bit worried about that and um, and find out if the, you know, find out if I can work with the physio to kind of support the family to, to do some of that work. And I would stay with the family to do that. When I was working in palliative care, I would be there with the physio. I'd be there with the family. I'd be there with whoever else we could get in the room just to kind of support that confidence. When it comes to um, experience, so again, looking at two things. What are the past experiences? And really, the, this has been, this has come up a lot already in the conversation. Greg's, uh, Joe's got some really salient experiences around death to do with the same condition that he has. But what did he learn? And how are they related to his beliefs and values? But also, how does he look back on it? What would he change? What would he keep? And we've already talked about a lot of that. And what were the informal experiences? So this is where it might be, so this is where we're kind of trying to extend into not just the health or service exchanges that that person had. So for example, Joe's dad, there was an experience with ICU. And, and lots of lots of conversation. It was clear that he talked a lot about the ICU experience and the medical experience around that. But when we dug a little further, what happened was there were all these people around him. There were family, there were friends, there were connections, there were food things that were set up. He remembers all this other stuff as well. And sometimes eliciting those stories can be a really important part of of the next step and I guess the focus we're going to have on advanced care planning as well. So what are the informal experiences? Don't just think about the formal experiences. Bring to life, if you can, the informal experience. What did the school do and what did your mates do? And what about the neighbours and what happened then? Um, and I think in terms of our reflections as health professionals, and supporting your colleagues, I guess, also, who may not be doing as uh, the work that you're doing as health professionals. But having, thinking about when we're, when we're assessing people, anytime, um, who, who are the people in, in your client's life who may have the same role that you have? I know that sounds a strange question, but, there's usually a nurse, right? What, what network have you 
it's rare to meet a network or a group of people or a family where there isn't a nurse, right? Somewhere in the family. There isn't someone around who's just been through the experience of death and dying. And that can be really an important part of, of mobilizing this action part of, of um, uh, it's, uh, action part of death literacy. I just realized I skipped straight over to action then, didn't I? You've got experience up there and I'm looking at action down here. Um, sorry about that. So let me just skip forward and I'll go back. Is that better? Now it matches up with what's coming out of my mouth, right? Yes? Mm. Yep, good. So um, thinking, about, thinking about both of those experiences. So just going back, um, our own wisdom becomes really important. And I'm not talking here about self-disclosure, but really being able to reflect on our own experiences in the same way that we would hope that cardiologist could reflect on his experiences and be able to reflect on what was pushing his buttons, pushing the experience around um, fears and concerns. So being able to really evaluate our own death literacy, I think also is an important part of kind of understanding what pushes our own comfort zone as health professionals. I've certainly worked, working in an acute hospital, I remember how difficult it was for people to, and people would often raise it kind of quietly on the side and, and not want anyone really to know. But when they, when they had a death doula or an end of life doula, or if they had a friend um, who was helping them on the side, they would keep that quiet from the health professionals as much as possible because they felt like they were almost like doing the wrong thing, but it was so helpful to them. And health professionals have a role in understanding what are in our informal networks in our communities because chances are, like Alan was saying this morning, 95% of the time our clients are in that space. They're in their garden club. They're, de they're dealing with the teachers at school or the networks at school. They're dealing with all of these informal networks that are around the person and because those informal networks are about life. They're not about the disease and about the things that we often represent as health professionals. So just going back to advanced care planning. So the thing about advanced care planning, when I think about advanced care planning, I know this will be the case for many of you as well, hopefully, but um, when I think about advanced care planning, I think about it really as a tool to connect people with uh, how to implement the things that they want at the end of their life. So with a so as a health professional my role is to understand about is to understand that person's network because i can do an advanced care directive with someone or the doctor can do an advanced care directive with someone or the team can or whoever and the piece of paper may actually not mean anything to anyone because no one knows how to implement that in the same way that we talked about the band I would say in Joe's case, the band was a key part of implementing the advanced care directive for Joe, because it was very possible they were going to be there for a cardiac event. So in that case, um, how were they going to respond was really important to what might happen next. If they didn't understand, if Joe didn't say to them, hey, um, I need you to do this, this and this, because this is my plan and this is important to me, um, then they wouldn't know what to do next. Thoughts, questions, ideas so far? Michelle's got a big comment here. Uncovering, understanding. Yep. Yeah, I think, um, has everyone read that comment? It's, it's such a great point, Michelle, about confidence. So, and I think that's the other thing about death literacy as well. I think it brings a kind of confidence with it. If, if you know what's possible, if you know what your options are, 
which I think are different to choices. And I know that's kind of just like a bit of a linguistic argument, but we've all got access to a million choices or however many choices around the end of our life. But actually in some areas or because of my family or because of my values or because of whatever, I have this many options. So if I don't know all of my options, then I can't access them and I can't share those options with anyone. That's to me, the essence of, of death literacy is being able to kind of know that, know those options, have someone walk with me or help me kind of explore those options so I can say yes, no to whatever I want. And that's kind of the confidence, um, the confidence, but then that itself, it's completely useless. So one of the things that Julian Abel and a few other people, including Alan did, is publish, the, publish a recent article on advanced care planning reimagined. And they did this in the context of COVID because of all the changes really that have happened, particularly in the UK, around how people, um, and, and in Australia as well, how many people are dying at home. Like how many of you are seeing that massive increase of people dying at home because they are putting to, they are enacting their, um, their choices and what they and the options that they have access to, to um, like a really significant degree. So Advanced Care Planning Reimagined, they talked really about that article, uh, in the article about three things. They talked about how advanced care planning discussions are mostly at the moment focused on um, end of life decisions. And what they're suggesting is what we were talking about at the beginning, that, that actually this is, um, we've got to broaden how we think about advanced care planning and and we need to think more about the social ecology of, of the dying experience, which means that advanced care planning must be an inclusive process that encourages and embraces the patient's social network. So we can't really um, enact all of, all of that plan until the network actually is involved. So, Three things um, they say to ask are what, what matters most to you in your life when you're well? Which of these will become priorities when you're less well? And how will you gain access to support from your social network at a time when you become less well and need to ensure the priorities that you describe in number two, in point two? Thoughts, reflections on that? Imagine for some of you. So um, yep. from, from the point of view of the documents available around Australia where um, uh, advanced care planning is supported by statutory law, some um, approaches in states and territories do support that kind of framework and others don't. Um, so others, you know, Western Australia, for example, have, you kind of have to identify a treatment, a medical treatment that you would or wouldn't want. Where, you know, um, at, at sort of at the outset. Whereas in Victoria, there's this opportunity to talk about what your values are, what's important to you. Um, yeah. So, so I would argue that even deciding whether or not you want a treatment or not is still a values-based conversation that someone will have to enact for you at some stage. Um, sure, but, but I, guess, well, I guess the point that I'm making is that the format and approach in some of the documents facilitates the communication of values. Right. <laughs> and some don't. Yeah, right. got it. So yeah. that's where I, I look. I think so that I reckon that is a really, um, for me, a, helps highlight the distinction between 
advanced care planning and the advanced care directive, the piece of paper. And so I think the piece of paper is kind of like a tiny weeny little drop in the ocean compared to this, the, the planning, which feels like it could be this big, the conversation, mm. and usually happens over, what, two, three, four, five conversations sometimes or, and more. You know, if we think about Joe, Joe's got to go talk to a lot of people before he can think about what's important to him. And his piece of paper might look a particular way because of all of these conversations. But I think it is, I think that to me really highlights the, the distinction between those two things. Mm. Um, mm. And, and whatever, yeah, like um, the piece of paper almost to me is like the medical thing mm. and everything else is the social it's a, that up until that piece of paper is a social experience, I reckon. Mm. So that's a real yeah, but that's a point. I guess some of, some of the legal documents can incorporate more of the social <laughs> um, in their design and the kind of model that's being used and, and some less so is the kind of point I was trying to make. That's, yes. But well, don't they all sort of go together as well? Because even if you have, a, and I'm, I'll exaggerate to make the point, if you have a list of treatment that says X, Y, Z, it would be very helpful, I would imagine, for a medical um, professional to put that into context of values <laughs> and, and where does it go. So it kind of goes hand in hand. I think it's very useful to have both, whether they are... Um, totally legally recognized in that particular jurisdiction or not because it the more information i think a medical person has the better it is mm -hmm. yeah. when, yeah. when i talk to people i often there's mm. usually a note section or or a blank like piece and i say that's where you can design your death and if you talk about your visiting hours and talk about what music you want and talk about who you do or don't want there and what you want it to smell like and feel like and do you want to be out in the sunshine and because all of that stuff will also inform how the the medical wishes are, are dealt with and carried out yeah great point thanks Beck. thank you does anyone else want to um, add anything about that yeah yeah, hi, um, everybody. Sure. Kerry, g'day. Um, one thing that I just can't stress to anybody enough um, that wants to talk about death or dying with me is the, um, you know, the uh, groundswell. What did you guys put out, you know, the other uh, set of cards online and you can answer the questions, create your own questions and put the, the answers in. Part. Yeah, and then it saves to the PDF. I have had people do that. And then I just say, put it on your phone, it, all of your loved ones, anyone that's going to maybe end up having to take you or meet you in an emergency, or you're going to end up back in the hospital, have it on your phone so that you can bring it up. So whilst it's not a legal document, it's got that information there. And it's been, it's worked for some of my clients who have had to do it because, you know, obviously in that moment of stress and not really knowing what to do, because they, a lot of them assume that their advanced care plan or um, health directive they think the medicos are going to go to the computer and have a look yeah. to see if it's saved in the system in that facility. They just assume that, which obviously they don't. Mm. I know from personal experience, it doesn't happen. So that uh, thing that you guys came up with is just a brilliant tool you might want to share with these guys and whoever listens to it. Yeah. Um, the, yes. And, and so the one, the, the one that we used to share originally was the one in the US the, from CODA, C-O-D-A, mm. where you could kind of move the cards around. And then Palliative Care Australia had one for a little while. And then I think that's all, last time I looked for that, it was offline. And, um, and I think that there were, like the other thing you can do, of course, is just come up with a whole heap of values and, and cut them out and put them on cards and kind of create your own. But the CODA ones were the ones that you could kind of move around on screen and then Palliative Care Australia. But anyway, I think that that's gone now. But can I just say there's something really amazingly unique about this conversation in that that we may be, given the people that we are on this call, and maybe this is um, for people who might watch this video afterwards, that these 
don't t we mustn't take for granted that these conversations are happening in our teams in our health environments the they're not um they may not be happening so for anyone who's watching the video afterwards and kind of thinking about advanced care planning and thinking about how do i support with you know okay i know how to do advan an advanced care directive for a client i know how to do that i know the form to fill in but how do i turn this form this form this thing this static thing that's going to go into someone's medical record how do i make it a social experience how do i um, bring it to life how do i help the person bring it to life so that they are enabled when they need to use it so don't take for granted that these kinds of conversations are happening um, in our clinical teams this is a tool that julian uh, has shared some of you might have seen it before have have people seen this before so this is a, a, a version, I'm not sure if it's the late, latest version, but a version of a tool that they would use in Froome as part of the Health Connector program. So when someone was doing their advanced care directive and they were filling it out, over the course of the conversations that would unfold, the Health Connector, not the Community Connector, but the health connector, the person who, who would be helping someone develop their advanced care plan and directive with their families and communities would also start to think and map out who were the key players in the person's life. And this is just a really simple version of an eco map and how, what are the things you can do to uh, who are the, you know, one of the things you can do as a health professional to think about, well, who can we, um, who can we, how can we support people to start to think about who's around for them and bring to life the plan? Is everyone familiar with that? Is that a new thing? Just hand up if it's new. Yeah. Okay. So the other thing you can do, of course, is just get it. And I've done this a million times, an A4 piece of paper and just draw it, play with it, draw, draw lines between people, draw the map um, for people. As, um, as you're doing the planning with people. Okay. Sorry, sorry Carrie, I think Catherine had, um, had something she wanted to say just sorry, before. Sorry, Catherine. Right. Just you need to unmute Catherine. Okay. I was only going to mention one word that makes a very big difference when um, people are writing their advanced care directive type documents is the use of the word because. I don't want this or I do want this because. And that's how you can link up the sort of the social, um, the social meaning. That's great. I just think it's a very important word. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Oh, great, great tips. All right, so last aspect of death literacy is about knowledge. Um, does the client know what is available to them, like actual factual knowledge. Do they know about what happens when you die at home, for example? If they want to die at home, have they thought about what will happen afterwards? If they want to die in the hospital, but it's important for them to be have a home funeral, do they know about the logistics around being able to do that? Do they understand that? This is where our knowledge as health professionals sometimes can be limited because we're not, this is not necessarily the professional knowledge that we're taught because some of it is because we we're taught to learn about how to care for the dying up until the point that that person dies. Um, and often in our hospitals, for example, the policies kind of end as soon as the funeral directors turn up at the door. So how, what happens next is really important because I would say the other thing that I learned as part of being um, part of an acute hospital was that all of the knowledge that my colleagues had was based on what funeral directors told them happens after the, the body is, uh, leaves the hospital. And so, and that knowledge again is professional knowledge not necessarily community-based knowledge or not necessarily the whole range of options that people have access to. For example, being able to take your dead person home after they die. 
Legally, we know we can do that, but the logistically, if someone thinks that they can do that, um, they need to know more about their options. Otherwise, it's very easy for someone to say, oh, no, you can't do that. That's mm. not possible. So if someone wants to look at what happens after death, and uh, then, then we need to, as health professionals, understand more about what's going on and what, what our options are in the community. And this is where I think in, um, a funeral, really connecting and knowing our funeral directors and being able to understand the range of services that funeral directors can offer can be so empowering for families and so important. Okay. Um, all right, let's go back to Joe. Uh, Joe, yeah. Uh, so, so the thing about Joe really, and this is just a summary of, of where we got to with Joe really, what we explored what his strengths are, what his values are, and how the health system might support those values. There were some limitations with that, and there were some challenges. Some of it may be kind of personal, um, some of it professional, some of it just difficult to kind of manage within the health system. We also explored um, some of the barriers. We talked, and there were some great points about the, the kinds of resources that existed in his family. And I reckon we could push it even further. We know that he has kids. So, and his wife's a school teacher. So there's probably resources there and connections there within his network that are much broader than we currently can see in, in the conversation or in the, the kind of information that we've got so far. How can we, as a health professional, draw on our own knowledge? So it's not about self-disclosure necessarily, but about kind of asking questions that you know are important. As, as a clinical psychologist, I could have easily have just focused on the anxiety and maybe the capacity. Does Joe have capacity to even make these decisions? Has this guy lost his mind? Um, you know, what's going on with his anxiety that, that he thinks that losing some weight is not an option? Um, I could do some motivational interviewing with him and try and get him to change his behavior. There are so many things I could have done to him as a clinical psychologist. So, I really work, I really, I think my death literacy enabled me to, to kind of hear um, more of the story, to understand more. And I also, I think um, having the capacity to kind of go there, um, despite maybe, you know, he was a kind of anxious, frustrated, kind of cranky guy, um, you know, in, in the room with me. I thought actually they were there for marriage counselling when they first came in the room. That's the kind of uh, they had on their face. I thought, oh, no. Um, and, and uh, you know, there was such relief um, in being able to go there with this, with, with this couple. So... In summary, thank you so much for being part of the conversation today and really kind of, yeah, not leaving me out here as a talking head. I hope it's been helpful. I hope it's reinforced what you already do and maybe stretched some of your thinking. I think often for us working in the health system, for those of you who are in the health system, part of our challenge is often helping and supporting our colleagues to stretch into this space as well because death literacy really is a resource and and for those of us who are death literate and working in the, in the space we're, we're sharing that as well um, with our colleagues and as well as our as well as our patients as you know and also within our um, families as well so thank you so much I, I would like I know we've gone a couple of minutes over time but I'm really happy if anyone wants to hang around for a few more minutes to have a bit more discussion, I'm totally up for that. Um, for people who have to go, that, that's fine too. But thank you so much.